Welcome or welcome back to another episode of Farside Chat with Bukasa. To close off Women's History Month, today we have the honor of sitting down and chatting with Councillor Rowena Santos from the city of Brampton. She was elected in 2018 and is the first Filipino elected to council in Brampton and the region of Peel. Prior to being elected, she worked at the Ontario Legislature for over a decade, most recently as a director and has mentored countless youth to be politically active across the greater Toronto area. So welcome, Councillor Santos. Thank you so much, Phil Casa, and thank you, Danielle and Carla, for, for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. Mabuhai. <laughs> Amazing. Mabuhai. All right, so we'll get right into it. I'm going to ask the first question. So um, we've been really interested about uh, your background, especially your academic background. And we noted here that you have such an amazing exemplary academic background. You attended the Schulich School of Business at York University for your undergrad, and then you went ahead and pursued your master's in sustainable development and environmental planning from the London School of Economics. I mean, wow, these two institutions are already way, 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 way big. But um, how did your educational background prepare you for your community involvement and your current role as city councillor? Well, you know, I am, um, I never really thought I would become a politician or get into, into politics. In fact, when um, I decided to go to the Schulich School of Business back in 1997, 1997, 1998, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> that was like the year of the Backstreet Boys. Um, the, um, I um, I was going into Schulich in business school to pursue accounting, actually, um, because my dad was an accountant and a lot of people in my family in, uh, were, were accountants. And so I was going to do accounting. Um, and I found very quickly, especially through financial accounting, that uh, accounting was not my calling. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I instead um, decided to specialize in marketing and branding. Um, and in business school, the, the skills that really were so transferable, whether that's in the private sector, the nonprofit sector, the public sector, is really um, analytical thinking and critical thinking and looking at data and numbers and, and having the ability to present yourself. In business school, we did a lot of presentations to our classes and had to go through many casework studies, which um, helped to um, develop a skill in problem solving. And certainly in, in politics, uh, there is a lot of problem solving that needs to happen. Like if you look at the pandemic right now and the crisis right now, with limited data, with limited resources, you have to be very strategic um, in order to, you know, deliver on the needs of, of you know, which is a, what is a life and death situation. Um, and so some of those skills were, were super important uh, that I think I carried uh, from my business degree and corporate experience into being a politician. Now, in terms of London School of Economics, by the time I wanted to pursue my master's degree and I got accepted to the London School of Economics in England, um, I already started to have a very deep passion um, for addressing climate change and sustainable development and environmental issues. And um, I went to London School of Economics from 2003 to 2004, which my gosh, still seems so long ago. Uh, and, and what's interesting in England or in Europe at the time, because I lived there for a year, what's interesting there is that a lot of the policies that I was studying and, and planning policies and stuff on the environment are policies that are now only being implemented in Canada. Because Europe, usually when it comes to sustainable development, the environment, they're a little bit farther ahead than North America. And so in Brampton, when we're tackling on a suburban culture that we have right now, those uh, policies and that academic knowledge that I gained um, in my, I guess, mid-20s, it would have been, um, are now are finally applicable here in Brampton and in Canada. So, so that was great. Now, the one thing I will share that is, uh, that was highly valuable that I would give advice to all young people is um, I actually lived on campus. So I lived in Toronto when I did my business degree and I lived in London, England when I did my master's degree. And the life experience and learning you get from living in another city on your own is invaluable. 
you know, I, there's no way I would have been able to understand why driving a car all the time is not necessarily the best option if I didn't live in Toronto, if I didn't live in London. Um, because there in Toronto, people are riding bikes. In London, they're all taking transit. I didn't own a car when I lived in Toronto or in, in London. Um, and so, so the life experience, I think, was the most valuable piece uh, in terms of my learning and how it's applicable to my job. That is so wonderful. And I mean, it really, living in another city, like, really expands your worldview. You're like, oh my god, there's things outside of my neighborhood. And, you know, that's just so wonderful to hear. Um, so you mentioned that, you know, you never really thought that you would end up as a politician. And it looks like what you really took on from your education is that sharing of that knowledge. Um, but I also want to know, you know, what inspired you to be like, yeah, I think I think I could teach people about the things that I've learned and apply it to Brampton. What pushed you to do that? Well, uh, like running in Brampton in particular. So after I got my master's degree, um, you know, I've always had this drive and passion to try to make a difference. And even from when I was a young child, um, my Tito Rolando, who used to babysit me when um, when we were younger, um, I asked him, I was like, was I always this excited to do things like always like, you know, what's what's the word happy and like enthusiastic. And he said to me, you know, when you were five years old, you were exactly the same way. Like you're always like wanting to go and like go after stuff. And, and I, but I've always had a passion to want to make a difference. And when you're in the corp, when I was in the corporate world and, and God bless everyone who enjoys working in the corporate world, it wasn't for me because my motivations were beyond making profit, right? And then when I was in the nonprofit sector, working in the nonprofit sector, my, my, um, I got bored because I felt like I wasn't making enough of a difference. And I didn't have that platform to really say what I was feeling or thinking and, and some of the social injustice that was happening, whether that was for me as a woman or for people of color in particular or the environment. And um, in 2006, when I was living in Toronto at the time, I ran for office for the very first time in Parkdale High Park. And Parkdale was full of many Filipino, uh, many Filipino um, uh, people in, in the community at the time. And I threw my name in the hat because uh, I wanted to increase reputation, representation on city council in Toronto and also do things on the environment. And from there, I worked 10 years at Queen's Park. Um, and my mission throughout my whole political career was always about climate change and representation, specifically making sure more women and people of color were elected. Fast forward to Brampton in 2018, I really ran because I looked at the Brampton Council and I don't know, Daniela, because you're, you're from Brampton, you, I'm not sure if you remember, but the previous term of council did not reflect our community in Brampton. Brampton is one of the youngest, if not the youngest cities across the whole country. We have 73% visible minorities right? Um, and we are the ninth largest city in the country and the fastest growing city. And yet our council did not represent that at all, did not represent that dynamism, that, that potential. Um, and after many years of electing other people, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try to bring that voice to the table with myself um, and see if I could break through. And, and, and we did. And certainly in this term of council, now two and a half years in, we've made a huge difference, like a huge difference, simply by, by changing the representation at the table. Wow. It sounds like, you know, you've really found your calling in politics. Like, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so now I know, like, you're doing a lot of good stuff in the community, and you're also doing your best to reach out to community members. Um, but I want to know how you balance, you know, self-care and community care. I know, you know, you maintain a very active lifestyle and actually play with a local band. Tell us yeah. a little bit about that. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, we're Filipino, right? Like, I grew up with an eight-track karaoke machine and all of my titas and titos singing in the basement. 
and I making <laughs> right you know you know it and, and my and my forcing me and my cousins when we were very young to perform in front of them we are the world um when we were when we were really young and um and so music has always been um an important part uh in in my life especially growing up my my grandfather uh, who passed away well before i was born was a conductor in the philippines um and so so there is a lot of music my mother um was a singer a young singer uh who was well known as well and uh and i play piano and guitar um, I was one of those kids who my parents forced me to start playing piano at the age of six. Um, and so, and so, uh, yeah, so Point of Order is the name of the band. And, um, and we, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, have just been creating videos to just cheer people up. And it's a way for me to showcase the artistic talent that we have here in Brampton. Um, so in terms of self-care, um, I started trying to learn more guitar um, during the pandemic, right? That's what I've been trying to do. And then uh, I remain very physically active. I, I am a huge believer in walking the talk. You know, Brampton is full of some serious healthcare issues, including COVID-19. And um, if I'm going to ask people in my community to stay healthy, I better be healthy myself. Um, and as a single mother, trying to balance work-life balance is, is hard sometimes. Um, and I was saying to a friend of mine the other day who was interviewing me for a book, I said, sometimes, you know, I don't do my dishes and I don't do my laundry yeah. because I have no time and yeah. I'm not going to stress about it. Right. Exactly. Just be right? so compassionate. Like it happens. You're not a superwoman. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Like, and it's unrealistic to think, you know, that you can actually accomplish everything on your own or like finish everything all your own on your own. And quite frankly, I don't like doing chores. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for saying that. I'm going to tell my mom. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like he gets up and I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to do the dishes. Literally. Today. Like, <laughs> yeah. And you know, that's, I think really important to just acknowledge that there are things that we're not able to do and that's fine that's part of being human and I really like what you said about you know how you're trying to pick up more skills in order to really improve yourself and just you know get in touch with yourself a little bit um yeah I think that's that's so wonderful for sure. and you know in terms of the self-care I think mentors are important and asking for support and help when when you need it is is super important I have I believe very much in mentorship and when I'm feeling down or low, I will, or meet a barrier with something that I want to achieve. I will call my mentors, mentors, I have a few of them and, and talk it through with them. And, and, and I think sometimes we are, like you mentioned, Carla, far more overly critical of ourselves, hard on ourselves. We need to be, that's my dog. He agreed. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> I definitely agree with that, especially that I think living in North America, we, we're in this, we're immersed in such a big hustle culture. Every day is just go, 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 nonstop work. And we have to take a moment to really just breathe. <laughs> and even if we don't finish our to-do list for the day, it's okay. Tomorrow is another day. Tomorrow's another day. <laughs> you know? So that's, thank you. That's thank ready. You for that. The one, the one, it's, it's so funny. There's uh, one new song that I'm working on um, to, to broadcast with Point of Order. It's by, I don't know if you know Wilson Phillips. Do you know Wilson Phillips? I mean, you guys might be too young. They wrote a song called Hold On. Mm. And uh, the lyric is, hold on for one more day. Things will go your way if you hold on for one more day. Um, you would probably recognize that the song. line, I think, rings a bell for sure. Yeah, so so that's going to be the next song we're doing we're doing next, and it speaks to exactly what you just said. I love it. Thank you. I and I can't wait to hear it. I cannot wait for this output. But yeah, no, I I know that your platform is primarily premised on representation, like you mentioned earlier. And now being a Filipino and an Asian woman in office is 
it's still not as common, despite, you know, our community being one of the fastest growing popul immigrant populations in Canada, mm -hmm. especially in the GTA. Mm -hmm. So, like you said, also, previous councils have not necessarily reflected the faces of our community. And so how does your identity play a role in the push for your agenda or your community initiatives? Yeah, I, I take that with, um, I take it with a lot of responsibility, which is why I love, love the fact that we are seeing like Phil Casa coming up and, and, and engaging um, more. Um, I take it with a lot of responsibility there. I'm one of a few, very few uh, people of color um, and very few or, or fewer Filipinos who are um, have the privilege to be in this position. And I think, you know, part of it too is because when our parents or, or when we immigrate from the Philippines to Canada, um, it's not necessarily the first thing that our parents tell us, you know, they, right? It's like, it, I, I, I don't really remember my parents being as actively involved in politics growing up, which is why your generation is so important. And in terms of how I, I deal with it, I'm very active when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I do choose to raise my hand and speak up and share who I am and where I came from. And I also think that when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism issues, um, I, I'm willing to be that one person of color in a room full of people who are white to bring up an uncomfortable conversation. Um, I was sharing with someone the other day that even with some level of improvement with respect to representation, I still find myself walking into meetings or being on Zoom channels or online virtual meetings full of just white people. And, and in person or even on Zoom, it's very uncomfortable to be the only person. Like you feel like you stick out like a sore thumb. And because of that, because we experience that, sometimes we don't raise our hand to speak because we already stick out like a sore, th like I feel sometimes I already stick out like a sore thumb. If I keep raising my hand uh, and talking, people are going to say that I'm talking too much or whatever it is that they say. And I think that we need to, and so I'm trying to be more aware of some of those things that hold me back when I walk into those rooms. Um, and just with a lot of vulnerability, share it with, with you, got, with you, with young people, with other folks who are thinking uh, of being at leadership tables, because we have to speak up, right? We have to raise our hand. The other interesting thing, and I don't know if, if you feel this way too, but what I've noticed is in our Filipino culture, we are kind of taught to stay quiet and not cause trouble. Do you agree? Yeah, I think it's that that community kind of centered thinking where it's like we'd rather not disrupt, you know, the dynamics. Even but yeah, though not have conflict or drama. Yeah. Like yeah. we just want to be smiling and happy all the time. I exactly. second that. I second that. But I think largely coming from an immigrant perspective, especially, is that I think a lot of the times we feel indebted almost mm. yeah. that, that's what I personally used yes. to I feel indebted to you know taking up space here so why who am I to complain who am I to raise my concerns you know like I'm already kind of affording the benefits of being able to live in Canada what's mm -hmm. what is that like why why am I gonna complain you know so I think yeah. that's why a lot of it is still a work in progress for sure, but I think that's why historically or previously a lot of our community members have been kind of, you know, soft spoken. A little bit more quiet. Mm -hmm. And Daniela, that is such a good point. That is such a good point. And it could be like you just you just um, triggered and I thought in, in my in my head about maybe that's why Branton sometimes gets taken for granted all the time. Yeah. Right? You look at Brampton, which is 73% visible minorities, um, and our growth is going to be based on newcomers. 
And, and so you, to your point, Daniela, if, if, if the majority of the population are immigrants, um, there is a sentiment of why should I speak up? I, I'm so lucky to be here. Exactly. Right? That's such a good point. I'm going to bring that up next time. <laughs> I feel honored. No, thank you so much for hearing us out. But yeah, I think I think that's been the common sentiment, like you said. And I personally have experienced that for the longest time. It took me a long time for me to kind of break that pattern. And those things can coexist. I can be grateful mm -hmm. for the space that I have in Brampton in Canada. But also, you know, like that's not to say that I'm just going to sit back, relax and enjoy as my community members suffer or as I yes. suffer, you know? Yeah. And I think that is the importance of like actually asking really our community members what they really need. Because sometimes it takes a little bit of a nudge to, you know, to find out what it is that they really need. Because again, there's that, that he, yeah, that shyness mm -hmm. factor to it, right? Um, so I think, you know, open engagements where you actually reach out and, you know, express that, that initiative that you really want to learn about them. I think that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're representing someone it's like yeah. really empathizing with their life experiences yeah yeah well you know like I, I appreciate this this part of our conversation right now right and this it, this is why stuff like this is very important is very important to me because I'll tell you you know once you're sitting at that at the table with that much responsibility and your life gets incredibly busy and and you are surrounded by uh, on a daily basis, uh, perhaps by people who don't have the same experience as you, um, you kind of not lose touch, but you kind of meld into the status quo without necessarily being conscious of it. Absolutely. It, it's just simply because that's your environment every single day. Um, and so, you know, that's why, you know, this type of conversation is so important and fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think more than ever, we, we really need to have this conversation, you know, like, with the rise of anti-Asian racism, like, unfortunately, these are uncomfortable conversations that mm. we have to have, we have to take up space, and we have to let people know that we are here, and we deserve to be treated well just for the virtue of being human really um so we want to know you know how do you practice allyship and you know like this racial awareness you know within your local community mm. so um i have uh you know important leaders in the community that i go to whenever i'm faced with um difficult decisions or difficult conversations or things that uh perhaps i think i know but maybe I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give a few examples. There was one recent situation in Brampton where council last year decided to rename a park after a particular councillor from the previous term. And council decided unanimously to rename that park. Um, last month, the black community in particular were very upset that we were deciding to name a park after that person because in 2017, they made very, uh, what was considered hurtful and racist remarks. And, and so there was this balance of, okay, do we name this park after a counselor who did do stuff for Branton and acknowledge that they did something for the city, um, but they, they really hurt a particular community um, in a very deep racist way. And so I reached out to people that I, that I know that I trust and asked them for advice. Um, and they shared with me that, yeah, we're still really hurt by what was said. They said that um, the immigrants coming to Canada should learn the white values of, uh, yeah, so it's something around like the newcomers of Canada should learn the white values in Canada. And, and that's what they said in 2017. And of course, right? Like I'm looking at your expressions and it's like, of course, if you say something like that, regardless of what you've done in the past that's benefited the city, people are, it, that hurts people, right? 
So we reversed the decision uh, and it was really tough. And, and um, the mayor and I, we, we spoke about it and we acknowledged that we made a mistake. And, and I think, you know, that's the other thing in all of this diversity, equity, inclusion, allyship is number one, we've lived, even as a person of color, I've lived be, as being a person of color in a certain way that is different from you, Carla, that's different from you, Daniela, that's different from a person from the black community, the indigenous community. I don't understand and I don't know everything. There's, there's no way. And that's what makes the journey in, in this so challenging. And so I think in my allyship, I, I'm just aware of that and sensitive to that. And I'm not afraid to say, I don't know, I don't understand. Can, I, can you tell me your story? And I'm also not afraid to say that I made a mistake um, because there is no way that anyone could do a perfect job trying to navigate through systemic racism. There's just no way, it's, mm -hmm. it's so hard. Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's not a problem that you can solve, you know, with a blink of an eye, you know, apologize and be like, all right, well, colonialism's over. It's still very deeply rooted in our community. And I think, you know, your, your message about acknowledging that, you know, all of us make mistakes and that's, that's how we learn. If you don't make mistakes, then you're not progressing really. And I think that's a very important message for you know, people who are looking to get into a leadership position in the future. And that perfectly transitions to my next question to you would be, you know, any advice that you can offer to Filipinas that are looking, you know, to get into politics? I know it's a very intimidating sphere. You know, you, sometimes people tell me, you know, you got to have thick skin to be able to, to work in, in, you know, in this business. So we would be grateful to hear any of your advice. So every single um, International Women's Day or Women's History Month, I, I give this, um, this advice. And, and it's a saying that I have that I've been sharing for a few years now. And the saying and my message is this, take your place, own the space, but do it with style, humor, smarts, and grace. And when I say take your place, I mean, Take your place at the table. Don't be afraid to sit there. And if there isn't a chair, then tell somebody to make some room. When I say own the space, I mean, fill the room with your voice, fill the room with your ideas and raise your hand um, when, you can, when, when, when you can. But owning your space also means owning your mistakes, right? owning your mistakes, owning it, your success, because when you own your mistakes and when you own your success, you will never be a victim, right? And do it with style, humor, smarts, and grace, obviously, is, is just the, the addition, but, the, but I'll, um, I'll do the, the humor side is, uh, to your point, Carla, about the thicker skin. For me, sometimes, uh, People criticize me on social media, people say stuff. Um, and sometimes as, as a Filipina, I get very riled up about it. You know, like I get very passionate or sometimes I take it too personally. But then I remember, or I think of actually how funny it is, right? And you got to find the humor. There, there are a lot of things that, where I've gone over the top my arte about when I didn't have to. And, and then I think of it like a two days later, and I laugh and say, oh my God, I was so ridiculous to think that that was such a big deal. Like, yeah. who cares? Um, and, and then the gracefulness part, obviously, is to be professional and respectful um, and, and always maintain as much as you can the composure of yourself um, without, letting, without compromising your values. So that's, that's the doing it with grace part. So take your place, own the space, do it with style, humor, smarts, and grace. And style, because hey, why not? <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. That's, I'm, I'm definitely writing it down. I'm going to print this out and put it on my wall because I, I need to be reminded mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I deserve to be here. Yes. We deserve to have our voices heard. Me and Daniela have this running joke <laughs> where, <laughs> you know, like we said, as we 
should like should. love love ourselves as we should know because yourself. no one else you know no one else is gonna know how you know how hard we're working we mm -hmm. need to acknowledge that self-compassion we need to acknowledge how hard we're working know yourself yes yeah. and <laughs> and you keep and, and keep persevering like keep going right like it's it, it's tougher for us we're, yeah. we're women of color I, I find that my whole entire career even in my academic career i've had to work harder i've had to wake up earlier um i've had to try to break through the noise of everybody else like my voice i've tried to, to break through the noise from everyone else and sometimes i don't get any credit for it Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's okay, because um, eventually we will break through. And, and ultimately, the reason why we are doing things doesn't lie, doesn't rest with other people. It rests with us. Yes. And that's, again, that's where the owning, owning your space is important. Fabulous. Wow. This has been a very lively and interesting conversation to get to know, you know, one of the Filipino counselors like here in Canada. And it's good to know that, you know, you have this personality where you could have fun and also acknowledge all the, the bad things that are happening in our community, but also keep an optimistic outlook on things. So thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, we really ended our Women's History Month celebration with you on board. So we acknowledge, you know, we are thankful for, for you, for your advice and we really wish you the best and we can't wait to see what other initiatives you have in the future and hopefully full casa you know could be could be in there a little bit 100 <laughs> percent. thank you so much counselor rowena and i do want to know just finally before we end off that we are so grateful to have been able to talk to you today i personally have learned so much from when you talked about your education earlier and how you kind of were able to just point out that you had that passion of being able to transform data into strategic insights. And now you're you're pretty much applying that in your, in your current role and your passion for representation, climate change, taking up your space and owning your space. I mean, I'm gonna put that on my vision board today. I'm printing that out. <laughs> the notes so, that I'm taking, like. Literally, literally. <laughs> it's gonna be printed out. <laughs> so yeah, thank God I have this recording. I'll, I'll be replaying this countless times. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's so moving to see you. It's so moving to see you occupy that space, seeing a Filipino woman in office in a city that I live in. I think that's, that's so, so powerful. So thank you for, for your work. Well, maraming salamat, and thank you for the amazing work that you were both and Phil Casa are doing for the community. Um, and, and, you know, you're opening doors for the next generation, for my son, who's now 11, and he's eating lunch in front of me right now. And, and, and I think that's the other thing, is like the work that I do, the work that you do, the more Filipinos um, who get elected in leadership roles, we are opening the doors for a better future for the next generation in the same way that our parents, their, their reason for moving to Canada was to open doors for us um, to have a better life. Mm -hmm. um, and so thank you for all that you are doing. And I'm more than happy to do whatever I can. And uh, whenever I'm available, don't be shy um, uh, to support you in all of your efforts. 100%. We'll definitely knock on your door. We'll be talking to you so soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>